I'm going to talk about what I think is a, thank you, a complementary uh, aspect uh, of water. And uh, what we see here in the background is a cell, it's a neuron, and uh, even though it's mostly water, you see that uh, uh, there's a lot of structure, and the yellow are cytoskeletal microtubules, and the red are actin, and between them, uh, uh, with ordered, uh, layers of ordered water, there's not much room for bulk water in them. But I want to start uh, with a difficult question, since... Uh, uh, life is mostly water, what is life? And there are four basic approaches. Uh, functionalism, which lists the properties or the functions of living systems, self-organization, metabolism, and so forth. But many non-living things have these properties and functions. For example, weather patterns. And, and what, we see, uh, what we see here on, uh, is the, uh, the great red spot of, of Jupiter. And uh, uh, also, there, then there's vitalism. Uh, mostly in the 19th century, uh, in which a unifying energy field, life force, or lan vital, was thought to pervade living systems, but it was unknown what type of field, electromagnetic fields didn't work, it became unknown, and vitalism became taboo and thrown out of, uh, of science by the reductionists. Um, and then um, complexity, emergence uh, theories have come forth, uh, uh, pump metabolism, self-organized criticality, edge chaos, but many non-living systems uh, have these. And then quantum vitalism, suggested by uh, 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 Schrodinger in 1935, and Constantine uh, alluded to this, suggested life derived from quantum coherence and that memories was stored in aperiodic crystal lattices, but life was thought to be too warm, wet, and noisy for delicate quantum coherence. Or is it? And we'll come back to that point. The other question... is what is consciousness? We take it for granted that we'll, oops, we take it for granted that when we open our eyes, the world out there appears in our head, and being is meant to imply conscious awareness, having an experience. And this is studied by neuroscientists, artificial intelligence, people, uh, roboticists, artists, physicists, psychiatrists, anesthesiologists, looks kind of like me for some reason, um, meditators and philosophers. And we don't really know the answer, although we have some interesting theories. Modern mainstream science believes that consciousness emerges from complex computation among neurons, but, uh, and the brain is a neuronal synaptic computer, but this renders consciousness epiphenomenal and illusory. It doesn't really work. On the other hand, Eastern philosophy suggests that consciousness pervades a deeper level of reality. Being conscious awareness is everywhere, as Constantine mentioned. But then, what is reality? And we don't really know what that is. Although many believe that it's hierarchical with a fractal-like uh, structure uh, called space-time geometry extending downward in size and faster in time to the Planck scale deep into the quantum world, which raises the question of quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. And basically, our world is divided into two realms, the quantum and the classical. We're familiar with our classical, uh, in which particles are localized and act like objects. And, and also, but at small scales, and we don't really know how small, there's quantum superposition, where things can be in multiple places at the same time, non-local and wave-like. But we don't see quantum superpositions in the classical world. And this is known as the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Uh, for example, Schrodinger's cat. He came up with a thought experiment that if you amplify a quantum system uh, to kill a cat or not, that until, uh, the, how would we uh, reconcile that? Uh, but I'll come back to that point, but let's ask the question, what is superposition? How can particles possibly be in two or more locations at the same time? The only answer I've ever seen uh, is given by Sir Roger Penrose, who applied general relativity where a particle is curvature in space-time, and a particle in two places at once would be curvature in opposite directions. Um, so here's a, here's a particle in one position, and it oscillates back and forth, and superposition would be the particle in two places, which means two alternative uh, curvatures in space-time geometry, and space-time actually separates. <clears throat> 
uh, if we apply this to, to the, me and I'll come back to that point, if we apply this to the uh, measurement problem of Schrodinger's cat, uh, there are several uh, possible explanations for why we don't see superpositions, what happens to them in our classical world. One is the multiple worlds hypothesis in which superpositions are separations in reality and each possibility branches off to form a new universe, some of which would have a dead cat and some of which would have a live cat. Another possibility is the conscious observer, or the Copenhagen interpretation, in which conscious observation causes collapse of the wave function. Niels Bohr, uh, Wigner von Neumann, uh, Stapp, and recently Chalmers and McQueen suggest that consciousness causes collapse uh, of the wave function. But what is consciousness? And must it be outside science? Because by saying consciousness causes collapse, you're putting it outside the system and you don't really know what it is. So, uh, it's, it's a pragmatic solution, but doesn't really help understand either superposition or consciousness. Now, Sir Roger Penrose suggested kind of the opposite, that self-collapse causes consciousness, that these superpositions of possibilities are equivalent to separated curvatures I mentioned before, and, but they're unstable. Um, you can imagine if these separations were to continue, each uh, possibility would go off and form its own universe and you get multiple worlds. This would be consistent with the multiple worlds hypothesis. But Roger said that these superpositions are unstable and will self-collapse or undergo objective reduction, OR, at a time t given by h bar over e sub g, the magnitude of the separation. Uh, and most critically, accompanied by a moment of consciousness. So bing, if you will, conscious awareness occurs every time the self-collapse occurs and it would be happening everywhere in the air and the water but mostly random and wouldn't amount to much. It wouldn't be the kind of consciousness we have. So, in a major advance in consciousness studies, we're now using emoticons, uh, emojis, to suggest uh, awareness or consciousness. Now, some of these may be pleasurable, okay? Some of them are going to feel good, uh, just by random chance, in, and they would be, have been present in the universe all along. W raising the question, did this objective reduction mediated proto-pleasurable feelings spark the origin of life? So life on Earth apparently began in a primordial soup proposed in the 1920s by Operin and Haldane, a simmering uh, liquid from which biomolecules emerged billions of years ago. In the 1950s, Miller and Ure simulated a primordial soup and found organic amphipathic molecules. They created the conditions that were present in the primordial soup, including electrical sparks for lightning. And then they looked in the residue and they found organic molecules or amphipathic molecules, amphipathic biomolecules. And these are really the building blocks of, of living materials. So an amphipathic molecule has a, an organic uh, pi resonance cloud, something like benzene or oil, with a tail that is polar. Uh, so this is nonpolar, and these, these tails have charges at the end and would be uh, soluble in water, whereas these would be uh, soluble in oil. Oil and water uh, don't mix. And all biomolecules, uh, uh, most biomolecules, are basic uh, variations on this theme. Now, the pi resonance group, uh, or benzene, whose structure was, came to, in a dream to Kekulé of a snake swallowing its tail, is six carbons with three extra electrons, which form these electron clouds called pi resonance because they're in the pi resonance orbitals or a, a cloud of delocalized, non-local electrons smeared out over space. And these can support electric and magnetic dipole oscillations, excitons, charge transfers, phonons, fluorescence, all sort of quantum properties, suggesting uh, that perhaps life and consciousness derive from pi resonance in biomolecules. Now, uh, oil and water uh, don't mix, so uh, they align into what are called micelles, according to Operin, who came up with the idea of the primordial soup. So they will tend to attract each other, and the electrons in one pi resonance will repel the others, uh, those in another, forming dipoles. And these dipoles then attract and couple, and the oil avoids uh, the oil like molecules, avoid the water, and form a nonpolar interior with the polar water soluble charges sticking out. And this is a micelle, and it's basically a protocell uh, of all living cells or all living uh, biomolecules. 
and proteins fold in this way. So aromatic amino acids, uh, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine attract each other uh, and form these nonpolar interiors, and the polar uh, charges stick out into the water to make the proteins soluble in water. When the uh, uh, pi resonance clouds uh, are near each other, they attract and form these induced induced dipoles. They're Van der Waals type 3 uh, induced dipoles. And then they oscillate back and forth uh, in, at 10 to the 12th hertz, in terahertz, which is infrared. So, uh, of course, in gasoline and benzene, it, it all becomes miscible, and this doesn't happen. But if they're arrayed at a particular distance, like in graphene or perhaps fullerenes, we get this oscillation, and they can also form quantum superpositions. So a system like this can generate uh, infrared energy, which is relevant to water, as Jerry Pollack has, has been telling us. This also occurs to, uh, to form lipid bilayers. The interior of lipids are for, uh, have nonpolar uh, uh, <clears throat> pi resonance groups and cholesterol and so forth, with the polar tails sticking inside and outside the cell to be soluble in water. And, even, uh, and also nucleic acids, the pi stack in DNA, is a nonpolar uh, quantum-friendly uh, region. And uh, uh, so this occurs in proteins, nucleic acids, membranes, pretty much all biomolecules in, in living systems, and we've been calling this the quantum underground, pervading living systems. Uh, Travis Craddock, Jack Tusinski, and I, uh, suggesting that there's a quantum basis for life buried inside in the nonpolar region of uh, biomolecules with the polar end sticking out into the water to uh, uh, order the water and to dance with the water uh, as Jen Georgi uh, predicted, and also to influence the, the quantum. So it works both ways. Uh, this may have something to do with consciousness because the, uh, all psychoactive compounds, including uh, psychoactive neurotransmitters um, like dopamine and serotonin, have these pi resonance clouds. Psychedelic drugs, LSD, uh, DMT, psilocybin, have more complex uh, pi resonance groups with a lot of opportunity for quantum uh, activity. So imagine uh, we're back in the, uh, the primordial soup and uh, uh, three to four billion years ago, and we get these micelles, these operant micelles, and they begin to couple, and maybe there's many, many more. I'm using three here just to, uh, to be simplistic. And they reach the threshold for Penrose objective reduction, which is still the only mechanism for consciousness uh, ever proposed. And this simple system in the primordial soup would have had a moment of conscious awareness of feelings, uh, some of which, uh, which is because it's really uh, connected to the structure of space-time geometry, giving rise to bing, or a moment of awareness. And uh, um, <clears throat> these would be uh, uh, <clears throat> mostly random and proto-conscious, uh, random, but some would be positive and feel good. So occasionally you get something that would feel good, and this could provide a feedback mechanism. Now the pi, pi resonance rings, pi stacks, have only a few stable arrangements. They can be in this T shape, or they can be in this parallel displace. The sandwich is metastable. So um, uh, uh, T and P are alternative possibilities. So perhaps objective reduction self-collapse to, to particular uh, configurations cause specific feelings. Uh, frowny face, sad if they're this way, and uh, uh, happy if they're, they're this way. I'm being somewhat arbitrary, but something at this level uh, must give rise to consciousness, and this would provide a, uh, a feedback fitness function for self-organization, raising the question whether life evolved to feel good. Um, and I've, I've written about this in a, in a chapter in a new book uh, that's just coming out now on, called On Human Nature, and uh, it's called The Quantum Origin of Life, How the Brain Evolved to Feel Good, suggesting that uh, primitive feelings that were present in the, in the universe, in the primordial soup, actually sparked the origin of life and drove its evolution. Now, I get a lot of uh, uh, flack for this because people are very fond of Darwinian evolution, and uh, justifiably so. It's a pillar of modern science. But the notion that life evolved behavior to promote gene survival is merely an assumption. It doesn't make sense for several reasons. First of all, all behavior is driven by reward or pleasure or avoiding pain. That can be hedonistic pleasure. 
It could be altruism. It feels better to give than to receive. Spiritual pleasure, pleasure uh, resonance, that sort of thing. Um, but basically, pleasure and avoiding pain. That's why we do everything we do, pretty much, one way or the other. There were no genes in the primordial soup. It was uh, millions of years before we got, to be, got genes, and yet life got to that point. And Darwinian evolutionary theory ignores consciousness and feelings. Generally, it's, they're thought to emerge from higher order complexity of uh, uh, a computation, for example, in the brain or lower organisms. Raising the question, did feelings drive evolution? And, and that's a position that uh, I, I think um, may make sense uh, to, rather than ignore consciousness, put consciousness in at the beginning and see what it did for life and evolution. Okay, but then what happened after the primordial soup? How did proto-pleasurable moments become orchestrated uh, to give full, rich, conscious experience? You could think of the simple OR uh, moments of uh, consciousness that are occurring everywhere, kind of like if you go to the symphony and you hear the orchestra warming up beforehand and each instrument is playing its own note, tone, sound. Uh, 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 you hear different sounds or notes. That's not music. Then the orchestra begins to play, and that's music. So I'd say the difference between our consciousness and the simple OR moments that are occurring everywhere are the difference between music and noise, so to speak. Um, but can there be quantum coherence in warm, wet biology? Technological quantum computers must operate at absolute zero temperature to avoid decoherence. For that reason, people said we were crazy to think that quantum coherence could, function, could be functional in living systems. But about 10 years ago, plants were shown to utilize quantum coherence uh, by exciton transfer among chromophores of pi electron resonance clouds. So the photons would be collected up here, and the energy converted to excitons and transferred through this protein to another uh, area where they could get converted to food. And these uh, uh, chromophores have pi resonance, and it's a quantum coherence. The energy travels through all possible pathways simultaneously in superposition, giving the most efficient transfer, which allows the most efficient conversion uh, to food energy. And without, without this mechanism, uh, probably uh, life couldn't exist. We wouldn't have efficient food production for plants, uh, animals eat the plants, and so forth. Could a similar mechanism support cognition and consciousness in animals, including ourselves? Let's start with a single cell organism, which, are, which is already pretty compli complicated. A single cell paramecium can learn, avoid predators, find food, find a mate, and have sex. Here we see it bouncing off an obstacle. It moves in an op opposite direction. Here we see two paramecium uh, conjoined actually having sex and uh, with a partner, Bing. Uh, I don't know if they are pleasurable, if they are having conscious experience or not. And uh, that's a little joke uh, emoji. Now, how do they do this? How do these things move around? They, they use these hair-like projections on the surface to both move around and to sense their environment. And the, uh, here we see the paramecium with the hair-like projections, which actually are made up of nine pairs of structures called microtubule in a cilium that is connected to inside the cell. And the same structure is found in uh, centrioles, which guide mitosis and, uh, and, and are known to uh, detect light uh, by uh, Al Albrecht Bueller. And th these are made of triplets of microtubules, the microtubule being uh, the basic uh, building block. The bending occurs by uh, the microtubule connected from one to another by motor proteins, which contract, use ATP, to bend back and forth by uh, motor proteins called dynenes. Well, jumping ahead to our, our brains, if we look inside a brain neuron, here's the cell body, here's an axon. If we look inside a dendrite, here's a microtubule. And material synthesized in the cell body must be uh, transported to a synapse way downstream and uh, branching points and so forth. And they're conveyed by these motor proteins, dynein, the exact same protein found in the paramecium uh, that conveys uh, materials. And uh, tau is a protein connected to the microtubule, which, act, which stabilizes microtubules and acts as a traffic signal to tell the motor proteins where to get off, deliver your cargo to this particular area so that the placement of the tau on the microtubule is critical. It's kind of a coding mechanism, and this is actually memory. 
and uh, because this tells, uh, tells the motor proteins where to deliver their cargo. Now, what happens if the microtubule disassembles and the tau falls off? You get Alzheimer's disease. Now, we know about the amyloid plaques, but the, the lesion that, that causes uh, the problem inside uh, the cell is, uh, is when uh, the microtubules disintegrate and the cell loses its shape and the tau falls off and forms uh, what are called uh, <coughs> neurofibrillary tangles and uh, the microtubules are disrupted. So this is the pathological lesion in Alzheimer's disease and also something called postoperative cognitive dysfunction that occurs from too many anesthetics because anesthetics bind to microtubules as I'll show you. And uh, repeat anesthetics in very old and very young people can cause this problem. So these are the microtubules, and they are, uh, occupy a large bulk of the interior of living cells, particularly neurons. And I got interested in microtubules back in the 70s in medical school and got the idea that they might be processing information. So you can see they're, they're hollow cylinders made up of individual proteins called tubulin, peanut-shaped proteins, that can have two or more states. And uh, we did some modeling of them as molecular automata and computers uh, and showed that they could process information uh, at, at the Froelich frequency, for example, uh, and that information uh, patterns of information could propagate uh, through, um, uh, through the microtubule and that this increased the capacity for information inside cells and neurons tremendously and the brain. And uh, artificial intelligence people didn't like that because it made their target uh, much further downstream to reach equivalents for information processing. Uh, and somebody said one day to me, well, how would that explain consciousness? And I didn't really know, but fortunately I read a book by Roger Penrose who came up, who had an idea that I mentioned be before about objective reduction, but he didn't have a structure that could implement this objective reduction and get orchestrated to give consciousness. And so I, I got in touch with him and he liked the idea. And we teamed up, and here we are in 1994 after the first Tucson uh, Conference on Consciousness at the Grand Canyon. There's Roger, there's me about to fall, fall in. Roger's wife, and that's Dave Chalmers, the philosopher. And uh, here we are more recently in Sweden a few years ago. And the basic idea is that inside neurons, for example, inside the giant pyramidal neuron, which is the origin of EEG, there are microtubules. And microtubules in dendrites and soma of neurons are unique in all of biology. In all cells, all other cells, they're uh, continuous and radiate outward like spokes of a wheel. But in the dendrites and soma of neurons, they're interrupted out of mixed polarity, forming these networks. And uh, we think that's so that they, they're slightly different energies and they resonate and give rise to beat frequencies, uh, interference beats at, at, at slower and faster uh, frequencies. So we put forth the idea that uh, quantum computation in these microtubules would reach threshold for Roger's objective reduction, and there would be a conscious moment, a bing, uh, which co coincided with a uh, process going on in space-time geometry. But microtubules are still fairly large for quantum, uh, quantum systems. But if you look inside one particular protein, the tubulin, you see a network of tryptophans, which have these pi resonance clouds, uh, eight of them actually. And uh, this, uh, when we map these, uh, we saw uh, that they looked somewhat similar to the arrangement of the chromophores, pi resonance chromophores in photosynthesis. And so if you think about it, if a, if a potato or a, or a carrot or a tomato can utilize quantum coherence, maybe our brains would be able to figure it out. And we think that the microtubules are doing something very, very similar. So uh, if you add the other aromatic amino acids, what I just showed you was for tryptophan, phenylalanine and tyrosine, uh, you see there are 86 uh, aromatic rings uh, per tubulin, and uh, here in the red dot is where anesthetic gas molecules bind to prevent consciousness. So if you think about 86 uh, uh, possible interactions, the possibility for uh, feelings, uh, emojis at least, uh, in one tubulin is enormous, and we have a billion tubulins per neuron and about 100 billion neurons per brain. So the possibility for uh, permutations and combi combinations of these feelings is very, very large. So the basic idea is that we have these pi resonance quantum dipoles that oscillate back and forth in microtubules in a fractal-like hierarchy. 
and uh, this, these quantum state, these enter quantum states and reach threshold, and we have moments of consciousness occurring at specific frequencies. Now you might say, well, that's all very interesting theory. Is there any evidence for it? And actually, there is. This is the work of Anurban Bandyapati's group at uh, NIMS, National Institute of Material Sciences, in Scuba, Japan. And he's done some very elegant uh, work, and he'll be at the uh, Sweden con conference uh, next week that uh, Constantine mentioned. So he, he did this, this particular study at three levels. Here we see two neurons with five uh, nanoelectrodes. And uh, they use the pairs of these electrodes to stimulate across this neuron and then measured effects in the second neuron. And only at certain combinations of frequencies were they able to get uh, see effects in the second neuron. And, uh, and then they plotted these and found these what they call triplets of triplets. They're not all frequency. They're particular combinations of frequencies uh, <coughs> that give, give uh, effects in the second neuron. They then looked at individual, an individual microtubules with the, uh, an individual microtubule with these elect uh, uh, nanoelectrodes, and then looked at individual tubulins. And at the large level, they saw uh, at the level of neurons, they saw these resonances where they got effects in the second neurons, and particular patterns in megahertz, kilohertz, and then uh, even hertz. At the level of microtubules, they saw it at gigahertz, megahertz, and kilohertz. And at individual tubulins, they saw it down to terahertz, gigahertz, and megahertz. So if you put this all together, this is the picture uh, that we've uh, come up with. And uh, <clears throat> so you start with a whole uh, a neuron, and the brain would be over here. And uh, you have EEG frequencies in the hertz, microtubule bundles in uh, 100 to 1,000 hertz, individual microtubules uh, uh, 10 to 100,000 hertz, Tubulins, uh, you're getting down to the megahertz, 10 megahertz, and then uh, gigahertz. And then when you get down to the pi resonance oscillations, you're in terahertz and uh, generating infrared, which can cause uh, uh, easy water, phase, phase four water, for example. And it also turns out that anesthesia acts at this level to block these uh, terahertz uh, dipole oscillations. So I want to talk a little bit about anesthesia. I'm an anesthesiologist, and I've studied for many years how anesthetics act to selectively erase consciousness. Our patients under anesthesia, their brains are still quite active. We do evoke potentials. They have an EEG. They're, just, they're not conscious, and they don't make memory. And in the, in the uh, uh, 19th century, uh, a bunch of gases were discovered that were able to cause all animal study to lo lose consciousness or lose purposeful behavior. We can't measure consciousness, but they would fall over and they couldn't get up. Uh, if you clamp their tail, they wouldn't move uh, in the presence of, of certain concentrations of these gases. And uh, uh, s strangely, uh, every gas uh, had the same concentration to anesthetize any animal. It took the same amount of gas concentration to anesthetize a worm, a salamander, a horse, or a human. Now, at the turn of the 20th century, Meyer and Overton, working separately, looked for a common factor for how anesthetics could do this, since their chemical structures are quite different. You have ethers, you have uh, xenon, you have halogenated hydrocarbons, and so forth. And they found this, this uh, uh, very uh, compelling correlation over many, many orders of magnitude between uh, the amount of anesthesia required to cause uh, the loss of purposeful behavior, so the lower the concentration, the more, the more potent, uh, with solubility in olive oil. And olive oil is uh, uh, a mixture of uh, molecules having a lot of pi resonance oscillations. So the more potent uh, the anesthetic, methoxyfluorine being the most potent, the more, uh, uh, <clears throat> the more uh, having the lowest MAC, uh, the more uh, it was soluble in, uh, in olive oil. So you can think of a body, if pharmacologists look at the human body as solubility phases to look where drugs go, and the anesthetics were binding in the most nonpolar uh, part of, of this uh, graph, where polarity in water would be on the opposite side. So consciousness seems to happen in this type of environment. Well, what do, what do the anesthetics do there? Uh, Travis Craddock, Jack Tosinski, and our colleagues have, have done a couple studies on this using a model system of of two pi resonance clouds. These are benzene rings. You're kind of looking at them on edge. And they oscillate back and forth in terahertz, as I mentioned before. And at room temperature, they oscillate at 68 terahertz. And then 
<clears throat> 68 terahertz. Now, if you add an anesthetic halothane, and I, I won't go into the details about this, it actually increases the frequency above available energy, effectively dampening the terahertz oscillation. The, the anesthetic uh, joins in the, the two benzenes and forms a, a system that oscillates faster, but there's not enough energy, so essentially the, uh, the terahertz uh, goes away and it dampens it. And I think uh, uh, Constantine mentioned uh, uh, a, a red shift or something ta uh, towards the UV range, and there's actually uh, evidence that uh, higher order a a animals, y humans for example, uh, have a higher uh, frequency of oscillations than, than lower animals. Anyway, we've since done uh, similar uh, tests on this with all the anesthetics and get a pretty good Meyer-Overton curve showing that the more potent an anesthetic is, the more it affects pi resonance oscillations. <clears throat> There's other evidence from the lab of uh, Rod Eckenhoff at Penn uh, from uh, proteomics, genomics, and optogenetics suggesting that microtubules rather than membranes mediate functional anesthetic effects. And they've even shown that this, uh, this anesthetic, which is uh, an anthracene anesthetic, is only uh, anesthetic when it fluoresces. Uh, they, uh, they gave it to tadpoles and, uh, and who have transparent heads. And when they illuminated with ultraviolet light, causing this to fluoresce, the animals went belly up. They stopped moving around, so they became anesthetized. And, uh, and when they ground up their brains, they found that the anthracene was bound to microtubules, and they said that this was consistent with our quantum mobility theory, uh, which was one, one version of the, uh, of the story that, uh, of, con of quantum effects in microtubules. Now, one other uh, point about this I want to make is back in 1995, uh, I was involved in a paper with uh, Mari Jibo, uh, uh, Kunio Yasui, Scott Hagen, and Carl Prebum, uh, about ordered water inside microtubules oscillating coherently according to the Froelich oscillation to give quantum optical effects called super radiance and self-induced transparency. So the idea was that as, the, as these proteins oscillated uh, by Froelich oscillation, they were causing the water dipoles to oscillate back and forth and uh, this led to uh, these quantum optical, this is from quantum field theory, super radiance and self-induced uh, transparency, suggesting that there may actually be photons, uh, for example, the infrared and perhaps uh, higher frequency photons generated in living systems. We, we sort of already know that. They're generally considered to be uh, waste products of, of metabolism, but they may be ordered. There's also ordered uh, functional uh, co uh, coherent uh, light. A couple uh, points here uh, before I close. One is that um, there, there's good evidence that if you have a nonpolar molecule in the background here, this sphere, in a polar environment. So if you put an anesthetic, which is nonpolar, uh, in, the, in the water or in blood as, as it gets to the brain, it perturbs the water around it. It doesn't want to be in the water, and the water doesn't want it there. So the water forms this cage uh, called the clathrate in some cases, uh, which has a pentagonal symmetry. And looking at uh, some of Jerry's work, uh, I see hexagons. So uh, this is an open question to Jerry or anyone we can discuss uh, later at some point during the conference of how these pentagons might relate to the hexagons. If you put them together, you get uh, fullerene-type shape with pentagons and hexagons. But the point is you're inducing geometrical order uh, in the water uh, due to non-polar. Non so uh, microtubules have polar charges, which are going to interact with the water, but the anesthetics on the way, uh, or any nonpolar surface, is going to generate something uh, like this. So, <clears throat> in conclusion, actually I'll come back to the conclusions. Let me just say in a very simple way that I think pi resonance and water are, are kind of like quantum and classical, and they interact, and uh, that consciousness literally is on the edge between the two, between the quantum and the classical. In fact, in the, cl in the collapse, mechanism itself. So let me go back and conclude and say that uh, biomolecules uh, have nonpolar quantum cores which dynamically order and are regulated by water at their surfaces. I think Zen Gorgi was, was quite correct that there's a dance between the, between the ordered water in living systems and uh, he said solids, but I would say specifically proteins which oscillate. For example, microtubules have these oscillations in terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, uh, kilohertz, and so forth. 
and uh, they're coupled to the water at their surface. So there is this dance at different frequencies, and you can have beat frequencies and resonance. And so I think consciousness and perhaps life itself is, is more like uh, music than it is uh, like uh, computation. The second point is that uh, pi resonance and microtubules generate coherent infrared oscillations. Mitochondria do also, uh, which could induce uh, the fourth phase easy water that Jerry uh, has been uh, suggesting in living systems, and this might, this might be a, a way to do that. And uh, uh, finally, as I mentioned, that uh, dynamically ordered water and microtubule hollow cores may generate uh, quantum optical states. So I think uh, water, of course, is, is essential. Uh, it's most of what we are. Um, but uh, the difference between the water in our bodies and the water in the ocean or anywhere else is that uh, it's ordered to uh, dynamical oscillations of proteins. I think microtubules are the, are the most uh, important, but not the only ones doing this. And uh, this is what generates uh, living systems and consciousness. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, regarding the microtubules and the easy water, if you look at, um, at old electron micrographs um, of microtubules, there's a, a, an empty space yeah. uh, along each one, uh, 20, 30 nanometers, yeah. so, which presumably means that there are no solutes there and uh, some kind of structure, easy water. And, 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 you know, which, which suggests that, uh, which makes one wonder whether it's necessarily the microtubules that contain the information or the easy water, which is, which is semi-solid, that it could, like a crystal that could contain the information. And, I, you know, I just, I, I just wondered about it. We did some experiments with anesthetics. Uh, I'm not sure if, if, if you're aware. We, we tried uh, uh, two local anesthetics, uh, bupivacaine, and lidocaine, and we tried fluorothane also, and the same result, that is, in, in a concentration-dependent uh, way, the EZ was diminished in size. And so we were wondering whether, whether the uh, lack of consciousness that occurs under anesthetic has something to do with basically wiping out the EZ water. Yeah, I, rem I remember that. I think James Clegg did some of that work. Uh, I don't know if you knew him. But, um, yeah, the clear zone around microtubules. The other thing is that uh, on the surface of the tubulant sticking out uh, into, uh, into the cytoplasm, there are uh, C-termini tails. The, the, the C-termini of the protein stick out, and I don't remember how... And, and they're, of course, charged. They have a lot of charges on them, and they interact with the charges. So one thought was that it's the C-termini tails that were responsible to the clear zone uh, and, and e easy water. But it could be... Um, the, the dynamic ordering and maybe the infrared uh, generated by the microtubules. But that's a very fruitful area to, to look at. And I don't know what ever happened with the clear zone. I don't see a reference to it at all. I think uh, people couldn't explain it, so they stopped looking at it. But it's a very, uh, very interesting phenomenon. There's one o Somebody had their hand up. Uh, one of the assumptions I think that you're making is that the water that was ancient is the same water as it is today. And I myself have a little bit of problem with that because the environment was in totally different. And I've um, done some work on changing the structure or the organization of water with different environments. Uh, can you make a comment on that? I'm not that familiar with it, although we chatted about it uh, briefly in, in, the, in the riot uh, yesterday. Uh, I think it would ha you'd have to change it quite a bit to have an effect on, on life to, to, to prevent, uh, you know, if what I'm saying is true, I think the, you'd have to have pretty profound changes in the water to have a significant effect. On the other hand, it could account for a lot of problems and diseases and a lot of things that are happening uh, health-wise uh, today that may not have been present back then. Well, actually, 
the water that changes, uh, that has been changed, and the different environment actually supports your premise more than the water does today. Uh, we can talk about it later, but um, the, the radical change which does occur in the water and that has prompted several large corporations to look at it on other planets to see if life is the same as it is here. Actually, it supports more of your theory. In that um, case, I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let's talk about that. You know, many people think that bacteria created our world. And bacteria possess a protein called FDSZ, which, as you know, is a very similar structurally to tubulin and forms protofilaments which have functions within many bacterial cells. Does FDSZ have the phenylalanine, the tyrosine, and the tryptophan that you mentioned yeah. in the same positions? And do you think it undergoes... Uh, conscious experiences, <laughs> and do you think that masses of bacteria, because I seem to recollect that you said something about paramecium being the minimum size at one time, do you think that a mass of bacteria, such as we have in our intestines, could have conscious experiences? Yeah, very good question. Um, probably not, because, uh, not, certainly not the kind of consciousness that we have in our brains. Remember, I'm saying that, that objective reduction is occurring everywhere in the atmosphere. I think, it, 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 you know, panpsychists pan would say that everything has consciousness. This is more of a Whiteheadian approach, which looks at process. Collapse is an event. It's a process. It creates a material state and then goes into quantum superposition. Uh, to have the kind of consciousness uh, we have, you know, if we go back to the simple equation, E equals H over T, uh, to, uh, you need a significant amount of E, uh, uh, mass, superposition mass, uh, which needs to be organized in a cognitive way to have meaningful uh, experience. Um, and that probably occurs only in our brains, particularly in dendrites and soma, where you have the microtubules in mixed polarity so they can have interference and resonance beats. So I would say that individual bacteria might have, including the FSTZ uh, protein, uh, might have uh, uh, very simple uh, uh, kind of random uh, moments uh, like might have occurred in the primordial soup, but not the kind of uh, organized cognition, uh, more like the orchestra warming up than the orchestra. Um, also, Archaebacterium, the other uh, uh, form of life, uh, has a, uh, not FSTZ and not tubulin, but a, a different protein that's quite similar. So, uh, and plants have them too. So all forms of life have either microtubules or something very similar to them, which I think is what, uh, uh, and microtubules respond to just about, and are sensitive to virtually any form of ambient energy. Um, uh, uh, my, whatever's out there, microtubules respond to. They, they perceive microwave, uh, maybe even gravitational uh, fields. Uh, well, they do detect gravitational fields. We know that from uh, uh, experiments in zero gravity. Uh, infrared, ultraviolet, uh, uh, maybe any, everything this side of ionizing radiation. So that they were there and they were capturing and utilizing all this energy, converting it to, uh, to in my view, optimizing pleasure and driving evolution. So uh, uh, I wouldn't say the micro, uh, microbiome is conscious as our brain is, uh, but uh, there may be uh, snippets of random consciousness going on down there. Thank you.